welcome to this video, a new episode with Astrid, your dietitian with tea, no C. And today we are talking all things migraine with PhD Angela Staten. Now, it is important to highlight that every person's experience with the dietary changes might be unique and the responses are going to be individual. And everything spoken in this episode is a reflection of Angela's own practice and her own experience. She has a very interesting story about her own migraines and she has written a book about it, specifically tailored for people who suffer from migraines and are looking for additional information that can help them improve the quality of life and live without migraines, or at least reduce the frequency as much as possible. So I hope you enjoy it and I see you on the other side. When I'm talking about a sodium potassium balance, potassium should only be consumed by food because the speed with which the potassium enters then into your blood is reduced based on the speed of your met metabolism. Sodium, salt, on the other hand, well, first of all, salt breaks up into sodium and chloride the moment you took it because the moment it touches water, it breaks up. And so the sodium has to do one thing and the chloride has to do another thing. So if you eat salt that is a mixture of sodium and potassium, which in the US is called, I think, half low salt or something like that, uh, then you're missing the chloride part. And so that is going to be a problem because now you're, you're out of balance. And so each of them have different functions. So for example, sodium, when it generates the voltage for the brain, it goes into the cells to generate the action potential and it comes out and the potassium goes in, but note that the chloride is mostly out. And that's because chloride is negatively charged. Potassium and sodium are both positively char charged. So the electricity actually happens from the friction of the sodium and potassium moving opposite to each other. But the chloride has to be there to sort of balance it. And so after all this, when the cell resets to its natural state and the membrane potential is reset, chloride is important in that role. So chloride does come and go from the cell to reset the membrane potential. But if you look at the cell, sodium is always outside and potassium is always inside. So it's not natural for it to supplement potassium because it's going to put it in the wrong place. And the biggest problem with potassium that if you take a lot of potassium or like if you exercise, potassium is usually then in the blood more than it should be. And so many of the deaths that are happening to athletes is because the potassium comes out of the cells as a result of the heavy work because sodium has to go in to generate all the energy and too much potassium ends up in the blood. And as a result of that, they can end up in a shock and they can die and they can have all kinds of problems. But to get potassium back inside a cell is extremely difficult. And so if you end up, say you went to a marathon and you end up passed out and they take you to the hospital and discover that you have very high potassium levels in your blood and you haven't eaten or drank anything, it's just naturally appears to be high. But it's the same if you take potassium, it's going to be high. To get potassium out of the blood and into the cells, they have to infuse you with glucose and insulin because that will chase sodium out of the cell and potassium can go into the cell only after the sodium came out. So it's a very complicated process. So I don't ever recommend anybody to supplement potassium. So um, I have a, a salt capsule that I've designed, which I use because I, salt is also an emetic and it makes people vomit. So um, not everybody can take a lot of salt. And it has a tiny bit of potassium and that's just to sort of balance out. So it's less than 40 times as much. It's very, very tiny. So it's not going to affect the amount of potassium in your blood. But if you start taking like over 50 milligram and most uh, supplements are like 100 or 99 or 99, I think is the maximum by the FDA, but I've, I've seen higher, then those can cause serious problems because actually they can cause migraine. Okay. You talk a lot about prodromes uh, and postdromes. What are these and why, what specifically makes that name as it like prodrom, where does that name come from and what it is? <laughs> I don't actually know where the name is coming from, but pro, I would figure it coming from before and post would be past. Yeah. And so the drum, I don't know where the drum comes from, from but so prodrom would mean it's a period of time that precedes a migraine and it can be as little as one hour and it can be as long as two days. And the post drum is 
uh, what you referred to in, in one of your lectures is when you feel kind of sort of like a hangover. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a hangover. It's when your body is recovering. So everybody's different and I can last one or two days. It used to last me about two days. And it basically is when your brain is returning to, because it's a huge stress. The migraine is a tremendous amount of stress on the brain and it can cause permanent damage to the brain as well. And it can also obviously lead to stroke and seizures and a host of other lovely uh, situations. So it takes a few days for the brain to recover, provided the sodium went to where it should have gone. And if it didn't, then you're talking about a cycle and it leads to permanent brain damage. Why, why would you say that all causes of migraines are the same, but the manifestations and symptoms can greatly differ? Okay, so that's based on where in the brain the migraine actually occurs. And so the migraine occurs where there's not enough sodium to generate electricity. And so if I have that area of the brain that, that affects my speech, like the Broca area, then my symptom will be that I won't be able to speech or a slur or something like that. But if it happens in, in the area of my, that is associated with hearing, then I'm going to have problems with my hearing. If I'm going to have it in the area uh, that is associating uh, it with, um, I don't know, say my eyes, then I will, the, the occipital cortex, and I will start seeing auras. So there's going to be, each will manifest according to the location where the area is that lacks sodium. And what is, like, I really want to ask you, is there a, um like such thing as migraine trigger foods? What's the deal behind this? Okay, so, well, we already discussed the sodium potassium imbalance, okay? And so some of the foods that uh, people often discuss as a migraine trigger food, for example, let's talk about a lot of people bring up avocado, banana, chocolate, MSG, uh, histamine, tyramine. histamines, and then there was another one. Um, tyramine. That too, but there was another one in bacon. I can't think of the, the term right now, the, the celery juice. Nitrate. Bacon. Nitrate. Thank you. That one. Um, so when we're talking about, these are very typical so-called triggers. And so it's very easy to actually explain. And it's kind of funny too. So let's start with nitrates because I think that's by far the, the funniest because our saliva is nitrates. And so uh, this whole thing is just a made up. So I don't know who came up with it. It was very successful, but actually nitrates are desired because they reduce blood pressure. But the problem is, is that migraineurs have low blood pressure to start with. And so if we eat foods that have nitrates in them, they don't cause the migraine. They just reduce our blood pressure even lower. And so that can cause a headache to a lot of people, which for a migraineur may turn into a migraine. But our saliva is full of nitrates. And so if you can sw swallow our saliva, we can swallow the nitrate in bacon. So there's nothing wrong with that. MSG is a very good one because a lot of people say, well, it's the MSG. So there are two parts to this. One, in the MSG, the letter M stand and, and letter M and S stands for monosodium. So I explained earlier that salt is sodium and chloride and they each have a function. And in MSG, you're eating only the sodium and you're gonna have a lot more sodium. It's MSG is quite salty if you ever taste it. And so you're going to be completely out of balance. And so it isn't that it's monosodium glutamate, but that it's a monosodium. Because glutamate is just like an amino acid, we eat it in everything. So it isn't responsible for the pain, but the monosodium can. And also you have to look at well, what are you eating it with? Because usually the kind of foods that have a lot of MSG in them are full of sugar, full of other kind of stuff that you shouldn't be eating. Like Chinese food, at least in the US, is so full of sugar, it's amazing. And then when we go to avocado, banana, chocolate, uh, we talked before, um, the potassium sodium balance. So I actually did a little analysis. I don't have it with me here. But if you look at the ratio of sodium and potassium, you're going to find that in an avocado, it was something like 30 times. In the banana, it's maybe 20 times. In um, I don't know, chocolate, I think it was like maybe 10 times or 15 times. And then there are some other foods like spinach and stuff like that. They're all very much, much more potassium than sodium. But in the body, if you look at the, an egg, the sodium potassium balance is one to one. And in the human body, it is one to one. There's a lot more sodium in the body than potassium, but sodium is much smaller in a molecular sense. And so in terms of the actual amount, if you put it side by side, they're one to one, but there's a lot more sodium in the body than potassium. And so we need to somehow balance what you're eating such that it's going to become one to one. 
And so you can't do that unless you put massive amounts of salt on the avocado, or massive amounts of salt on uh, the chocolate. And a banana, a single banana is also something like 10 teaspoons of sugar. And so we forget the price of the potassium in the banana, that it comes with um, nearly as much sugar as a person who is not on a low carb, high fat shoot actually it exceeds the recommendations, which is six teaspoons, right? And so here we're talking about the single banana having 10 teaspoons equivalent. Um, that's a huge amount of uh, sugar. And so that's going to cause a major problem for a migrainer. You refer a lot to carbohydrates being a problem of sugar. Why is this? I know you, you already sort of mentioned it before about the sugar um, and the sensitivity, the insulin response, and how the cell uh, responds to it uh, with the electrolyte imbalance and the, the sodium and the potassium. But uh, you also mentioned that, like, is there, like, when you talk about having a, a low, uh, a low carbohydrate diet, why is this? Like, how low or should be too enough or how much carbohydrate is too much, especially when we think about um, that specific response to carbohydrates? What happens with those who have like low fat diet or a high, very high protein diet or very high fiber diet? We know that fiber seems to be very beneficial for your health overall, your gut health. And like, where, what's the balance? Where, what is too much? What is too little? Um, is it very individual depending on each person and the severity of migraines? Like if someone who suffers all the time for migraines should be paying more attention to that versus someone who has them like twice or twice a month or things like that. Okay. So, so um, again, it's another complex question. So maybe you have some huge questions that um, a whole book would need be needed to explain, but so, so basically it isn't um, necessarily known how each person reacts because obviously they're all different and we also have different genetics to some degree and different sensitivities. But there was a time when I used to run in my group, the carbs threshold test, where I would ask the people to drink one glass of either cranberry juice, unsweetened, just as it was, which I mean, knew the carb content of that by now, I no longer remember, but I knew what it was, or have one cup of blueberries, which are considered to be okay fruit to eat, but still very high in carbohydrates, relatively speaking, so one cup. And so we knew precisely how much carbohydrates the person was eating. And I wanted to see at what point they would end up with a migraine. And it was really interesting to see that there is some difference, but basically just about every single migrainer exceeds their carbohydrate threshold. And by that, I mean, they start getting a migraine if they eat more than five or 10, somewhere in between five to 10 carb grams in any one meal. So not like a whole day, but in one meal. And it really doesn't matter whether that carbohydrate is coming from a very high starchy fruits or vegetables, or if it's coming as a pure sugar, it makes no difference because it ends up in the same place. Because if you look at very starchy vegetables, um, we don't have the metabolic systems to do much about fiber. So the only thing we get out of the fibrous vegetables really is the glucose. And it doesn't come any slower. People say, well, it reduces the speed with which it doesn't because in our stomach, they're unable to do anything with the fiber and it just passes right through. And the only thing they are able to pull out of the carbohydrates uh, uh, from the vegetables or, or fruits is the glucose. And it just goes straight to where like a teaspoon of glucose goes. It's exactly the same thing. It's pretty much the same speed and um, it has the same effect. Now, how you react to sugar will also change with how well you're controlling your migraine. So for example, I who haven't had a real true migraine as a result of, of being able to prevent all my migraines, will have a higher tolerance because my brain had a chance to recover. But somebody who is just starting on the process or is not even started yet, but is getting migraine left and right every single day, is going to have a very small threshold, very low threshold for the amount of carbohydrates in the diet. And there are some people who cannot eat any carbohydrates whatsoever. And some uh, I have in my protocol, I have all kinds of ways of eating. So the, the all my going to start with the low carb high fat, which in my case is a 60% fat and the protein, I believe in high protein. And we should talk about that as well, because that is actually a very good migraine uh, food 
uh, to eat a lot of meat, particularly. So my protein amount for the low carb high fat is 20 to 25%. And the carbohydrates are 15 to 20%. But for the low carb high fat, a lot of my migraineurs are still taking medications, which interact often, not always, but often, and we don't know which ones with ketosis. So I want to keep them out of ketosis as much as possible. And so they have to eat a minimum 50 carb grams a day. So they split up three meals a day. We don't snack and three meals a day and they split their carbs up and you don't eat salted carbohydrates and you don't drink water with carbohydrates because glucose entering the cells kicks sodium and water out. So you want to prevent that. So what you do is after you ate your meal with carbs in it, then you take the salt on its own, which will bring all the water and sodium back into the cell into normal and you won't get an edema. The other methods that I have are, of course, carnivore. Carnivore includes all animal products, including dairy. And it also includes mushroom, which is fungi, and kelp or seaweed, which are algae. So we can eat all these, which are fantastic. So we have a huge choice of foods that way. And then there's zero carb, but people can't tolerate dairy. Then we call it zero. It's not zero carb technically, because you still get carbs, but we call it zero carb. Those are the people who can't have dairy. And then I have the hyper carnivore where it is a carnivore or the zero carb, but with a little bit of plant matter. So they may add one to two carb, carb grams from plants a day and with little fiber, very little fiber because these people don't have the proper system for the fiber. And then I have the ketogenic diet, which is the standard. I, I go for the higher protein again in the ketogenic diet as well. Uh, we don't aim to get very high blood ketones is not necessary. We can only use so much. So um, I'm aiming for migraine free diet and migraineurs do need glucose, just like everybody else needs glucose, but it has to come from the protein rather than from carbohydrates. And when it comes from protein, it doesn't seem to affect the same way as when it comes from carbohydrates. Now, if somebody is eating the wrong kind of protein and eats a lot of it, and so this is a problem for the plant-based dieters because they're the plants are not full, complete proteins. And so protein synthesis may not start. And if protein synthesis doesn't start, then all the protein that has glucogenic amino acids will convert to glucose. And then it's going to be used as fuel. Then we have a problem because then it's going to go into the cells and cause the same problem as if they ate an apple. So we have to be careful of the amount of protein they eat. They have to meet the minimum, which I said at three leucine grams per meal. And um, at least once a day, they have to meet that so that they start. And I prefer if they, if they eat breakfast in my low carb high fat group, they have to eat it. They have to have three meals a day because it's still on medication. So we can't be on ketones, in ketosis. And so then I recommend they have the first meal as their biggest meal, because then the protein synthesis can last for most of the day and it will protect them from having a migraine. And uh, they may have a fourth meal, which is just meat before sleep. Um, and that's for those migraineurs who wake with a migraine in the morning. Like I used to wake with um, migraine 3.30. That was my standard wake up call. And that's usually from a sugar crash. And so when they eat meat, which is 50 gram meat, usually we prefer beef or salmon, but beef is the most preferred. It prevents a sugar crash at 3.30 in the morning. So you recommend to have a um, high protein meal before bed, like the general recommendation is also for diabetics? Well, I recommend a high protein meal for all three meals, or like in my case, I only eat two meals. So all of my meals are high protein and I only count the animal products into protein. So I don't uh, recommend anybody to eat legumes. I'm just not considering adding peanuts back because they seem to be okay, but there are some caveats with how the peanuts are okay. Like they have to be um, um, soaked in water to, to uh, sprout a little bit to release more of the phytotoxins, et cetera. Um, but generally speaking, we are on a zero starch group. So there's no starch in our diet. And even for the low carb high fat, there's zero starch. So they can, they only eat the low carb, um, fruits and vegetables, and we are not very vegetable friendly because of all the anti-nutrients in the vegetables blocking even protein, the protease inhibitors in plants. And then of course there's a the goitrogens in the crucifer vegetables and, and in soy. So we're not really vegetable friendly. So I don't eat any vegetables at all. I may have a little onion in some things, um, but if I eat anything, there will be fruits. I may 
tomato or peppers, that kind of thing. So cucumber, these are all fruits. So they're, they're fine. Um, they will have a lot less um, anti-nutrients, but uh, I'm not fiber supporter. And I found out, and because you mentioned that fiber is so important for our gut health and metabolic health, that you don't need a drop of fiber for absolutely healthy gut and very healthy gut biome. You can have a healthier gut biome by not eating a drop of plant matter, just eating carnivore diet. Uh, there were a couple of people who I've talked to who tested there, and there's some doctors who discuss it online as well, who've tested their fecal matter and compared it to, for example, plant eaters or people who ate a very diet, but healthy diet, so with a lot of fiber. And on the carnivore diet, you can have a better gut biome than you may have on the plant diet because it's very hard on your body to have all that fiber go through without any absorption or nutrients or any metabolism all the way through. It goes straight from your mouth to the colon without any change whatsoever. So it is very difficult on the body to handle that. And all the fermentation of the, the fiber is happening in the colon, which is our smallest area. And so this is why I find that many of the people on the carnivore diet on migraine do extremely well. And many of the people I actually asked to switch to the carnivore diet, it heals yes. them the fastest. So every time you refer to these protocols are basically uh, to support migraine prevention, uh, or like even if you weren't uh, preventing migraine, you would still support that sort of lifestyle anyways. Right. Well, I find, you know, by now I have a lot of people coming in who have no migraines. And I have a lot of doctors, friends uh, through Facebook or other social connection who send their patients into my migraine group. And they come in saying, well, I'm not a migraine, but my doctor sent me here to follow your diet. And so um, I have a very rigorous program based on the five-hour postprandial blood test, which everybody has to take. And that's a test where they take your fasting blood glucose and then a pre-meal and then for five hours after the meal. And the meal is set pretty much. They tell us what they ate. It has to be low carb. But now I let them do the test with whatever they eat and they can see the huge sky, you know, sky high spikes and crashes that occur as a result of oatmeal or what, whatnot. Um, and they check the blood glucose and blood ketones every half an hour for five hours. It's a lot of poking. And some of them have CGMs, continuous glucose monitors. And so they can take the reading from there, but they still have to poke for the ketones. And um, what I see on a lot of people who are coming in who don't have migraines, they may still have serious metabolic issues and the same system works. The only difference is that they may not need that much salt. So they will be getting less salt than the migraineers do. So is there a specific salt requirement for, for those who suffer with migraines much higher? Like if we know that the sodium recommendations are about 2,300 uh, milligrams per day for a uh, normal population overall, although we eat in average at, at least 5,000 milligrams a day. Um, what is the recommendation generally for someone who suffers from migraines? Okay, so the 5,000 milligram is coming from the processed food. So if you don't eat processed foods, you yeah. don't need the 5,000 milligram, right? Yeah. So um, typically, but I recommend, we don't recommend a particular preset amount because it, it is based on the size of the person and the activity of the person. We go by how much water the person needs to drink. They need to salt their water. So I, you never catch me drinking a cup of water. I, I drink maybe a sip because I'm talking to you, but if I don't talk and if I don't feel that I have dry, dryness, um, I will only drink one cup at the time, all the time, without exception, minimum. And there is going to be, in my case, a little bit more because I also have another condition that many migraineers have, which is POTS. But for just migraineers, it is 300 milligrams sodium per cup of water. And we calculate how many cups of water they need. And we take the 55% of the body weight uh, standard nutrition measurement for women and 70% for men. And uh, that is how much water they have to drink. And they start out with salting every second one because they want the kidney to get used to it. And also they have to usually increase the water that they drink. And that too, we take very slowly, like half a cup max a day, slow increase and stop if you suddenly start gaining weight or go to urinate too often and look at the urine color to tell us how much salt the person needs. So the goal is to retain the color of the urine to be in the yellow zone. Um, if it becomes clear, like water, then clearly either the sodium or the potassium was out of order because the kidneys dump the excess 
and uh, it will go with the pure water and there will be any, no color with that urine. So we use the urine as a guide, the urine color, and we, and everybody's electrolyte panel in a blood test will be normal. So we can't measure it that way. And we can't measure it by the urine. The urine is going to contain more sodium because my veneers are salt wasters. They use a lot more sodium because our brain is a lot more active. We have more neuronal connections than other people do associated with our sensory nerves. That is why we're so easy to stimulate with light or sound or anything else, but we use a lot more salt for the electrical activity. And so there's a study from 1951 that shows that a typical migraine wastes 50% more sodium in the urine than regular people. So just by this alone, you would have to take at least 50% more sodium. But if I look at the water, uh, like I um, would recommend a typical woman who drinks say nine cups of water a day to put 300 milligram sodium into that every single cup of water who, if, who is a migrainer. And so that's 2,700 milligram sodium just in water. That's on top of whatever they put on the food. And that will depend on what kind of foods they eat. So those that 300 milligrams look like, like in practical serves, like the, uh, um, okay, that's, an eighth, that's an eighth of a teaspoon of a finely ground okay. table salt. And so we use the table salt. And it's a finely ground, everybody uses pretty much the same so that we can, or they have to measure, which is a pain because it's very tiny. But so yes, we, it's, it's one eighth of a teaspoon. Okay, sounds good. Now, when I think about, like, especially looking at the uh, a better lifestyle for migraine prevention, uh, there's a, a, a huge dietary component, uh, especially when you refer to uh, diet, dieting protocols uh, like carnivore, or low fat, uh, high fat diet, low carb. Um, when we think about the, like a, a, a normal person, like, or an athlete or someone who is used to having probably the, a more balance or uh, have a, a much more different approach, they perhaps like eating or need more carbohydrates for performance or things like that. When we think about athletes, not necessarily just uh, the general population, um, what would be your recommendation in terms of, well, adherence at the end of the day is what really works for people. If you can adhere to something, especially as a protocol, uh, how much you need to adhere to it. So at least works for you, um, or at least your quality of life improves. Obviously, you want to make changes if it's something that is going to definitely prevent your migraines completely. But there are people that are going to struggle like everything else by modifying things that they like or their preferences. So how much do you need to change um, when it comes to like, what's the minimum effective volume or the minimum effective dose uh, right. for, uh, for someone who, who has no, has a different preference or like to incorporate vegetables or carbohydrates because they probably might not, it might not be, um, as useful in your opinion, but perhaps they are very feeling and um, when you're dieting in a very low calorie diet, that could really help you to stay satiated. Um, so it, it just depends on the preferences of every single person, but what would be sort of the minimum effective dose or like how minimum carbohydrates can you still have? Uh, you mentioned 50 grams of carbohydrate a day, but if we're looking at a population that is active, performance athletes how much can you go to the other side so you you have a little bit of balance but still sort of follow kind of what you're suggesting to implement to reduce migraine uh, frequency okay so i have to already tell you that i work with a lot of athletes okay i have several ultra marathoners marathoners and some competitive athletes and you don't need any carbohydrates for competitive athletics uh, at all and so if you look at Verta and their studies, uh, they will show you that you, you can be a, a, a top class one uh, runner or uh, whatever other kind of sports. I was weightlifter and I, didn't, I did my best when I went weight, weightlifting, um, fasted, for example. Like today, I'm still fasted. It is now almost, it's 4.15, I still haven't eaten. So the, some, some, of the, some people do better without any carbohydrates. So there's no such that you need to have carbohydrates. We don't have any need for carbohydrates. And it also, if you consider for a second of what carbohydrates actually mean, what organs run on carbohydrates when we look at our body 
we basically have very few organs that run on carb on sugar. We have the red blood cells and we have a little bit uh, our eyes run on glucose. So these are organs without mitochondria. Our liver runs on glucose. It can also use this fat, but it can't use ketones. But basically everything else uses fat. So 85% of our organs or our natural everyday activity is run on fat. So that are triglycerides. That is why they are kept. And then, of course, we can use ketones for some organs uh, like the brain and other elements. But, but generally speaking, we don't need carbohydrates to run and the muscles too. And the heart doesn't use glucose. It, it really, unless it has to, which is a problem, the heart actually runs on fat. So when, when you're looking at it this way and you're looking at an, uh, an athlete, you say, well, why would you need sugar? <laughs> if, if basically everything that you're using is running on fat, why do you need sugar? And so the only time you need sugar is when you, for example, accelerate or like if you're a lifter, you get to a very heavy weight and you have to lift it up. And that sugar is going to come from your glycogen that you have stored. And so if you are an athlete, all you have to do really is to eat plenty of protein the night before your performance to make sure that your glycogen stores are filled up. Because if you carb up, which is what many athletes do, that they carb up before an activity, well, you can't store carbohydrates. What is that going to become? It's going to fill up your glycogen reserves and then it's going to convert to fat. So the, the use of, I think is over overthought when we're talking about the need for carbohydrates. And so not to say that you can't have it, but you don't need to. And in terms of carbohydrate tolerance for other people who are not athletes, but regular people, it's the same thing. It depends on the person, how much damage the person has collected metabolically speaking over the years. So if, for example, you are young and you now go on a diet that is really healthier for you, meaning you cut out all the junk food and you cut out the processed food and you cut out seed oils and uh, the sugar and all this kind of stuff, but you still eat your carbohydrates, your fruits, vegetables, then nothing is going to be happening to you. That's not bad for you because you haven't had the time to cause the damages and your body can cope with it, provided that your body can cope with it. But a person who may have had 40 years of migraines and 40 years of medications behind that person and now has serious metabolic issues and maybe a cardiovascular disease and other kinds of conditions as a result, that person is going to react really differently to the carbohydrates and the tolerance of how much they need to stick to the the protocol is going to be different. And I can see that in my group as well, is that some of the younger ones, like I, I had a girl who came, joined us when she was 17 and she was on, I don't know, she had, a, I have a photo of a huge bag of drugs that she was taking, Topomax and all kinds of other things, Stop your minute. And um, as she grew, and of course she became migraine free, she could choose when to have a migraine. So if she wanted to go out with her friends and have a party and, and eat whatever she wanted, she knew that the next day she would probably get a migraine, which she could reduce with a little bit of sodium and other kind of tricks. But she accepted that that's okay with her. She is willing to give a little bit of a migraine time to time, as long as 90% of the time she was migraine free and she would focus on her studies and, and finish her university. She's in law school right now. Other people who are maybe older, 50 or above, they say, well, oh, I had a lifelong of migraines. I don't want a single day of migraines. And then they may stick with carnivore for life. So it's very individual. I don't think you can say who should do what. Yeah. Okay. Well, sounds awesome. I, Angela, I can't thank you enough for coming on to the podcast and uh, to have a chat with me about migraines. I think it is very enlightening to really talk all things migraine and like understand a little bit more in depth behind the scenes what is happening and uh, at the level of the cells in your brain and all the, the, the chemicals and the chemistry that comes behind that so that is a, a playing the role of that electrolyte imbalance sodium potassium glucose so where can people find you um and is there anything else that you'd like to uh, say well uh they can find me of course on facebook with my name, Angela A. Stanton or Angela Stanton PhD, or I don't know how I can be found, but the migraine group, the one that I would recommend everybody start on is called Migraine Sufferers. So they, if they put in Migraine Sufferers on Facebook, they're going to find me. I'm on Twitter at, under at Migraine Book, and I am on Instagram under Dr. Angela Stanton or Angela Stanton PhD. I forget because I have two accounts and they always confuse. So, but I'm connected to you. So people can find me through you and um, they can email me. 
through, um, I have several websites where the contact information comes directly to me. So they can go to stentomigraineprotocol.com, which is my main website, which is quite neglected because of lack of time. And then I have a nonprofit, which is stentomigraineprotocol.org. And that one um, accepts funds. And we've been getting quite a bit of funds, which then get to be used for migraineurs, like if they join the group and they can't afford the meter or they can't afford the book, then the, the foundation will buy it for them. And, um, and of course, um, they can always email me as well, the Angela at migraine-book.com. So, and so the, the only thing that I want to just say here is that the most important thing for migraine prevention really truly is, you mentioned in one of your um, videos that to monitor your migraines. But I think that in addition to monitor and to keep notes of when you have migraines, it is important for you to keep notes of what you eat and what you did so that you can go back and see a pattern. Do I get a, a migraine if the pressure drops or only if it increases? Or do I get a migraine at full moon? Do I get a migraine if my in-law in comes to visit? So you can then see when you need to prep a little extra to prevent the situation. So I think it's very important to keep notes. And then in time, and don't ever quit any medications because that's a very bad idea. But in time, as um, the migraines reduce, uh, in my migraine group, everybody tapers off of all their medications in time. So nobody even, I don't even own any headache medications, none whatsoever. So I don't ever, I am, I don't ever take anything anymore. So basically you can prevent migraine 100%. Okay. Well, okay. that's awesome. Well, uh, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into your book. Um, I sort of had to sort of sweep through uh, to get some of great questions for you today, but I'm going to dig deeper into it. I, I'm going to recommend it to uh, everyone else that uh, is looking for migrants too, but it was a pleasure to meet you. And it was I a hope pleasure that, meeting you. I hope you had a, a good time. Um, some of the questions, uh, did you, you found them interesting. Um, and like, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank you for staying till the end of the video. The most important thing about this episode is for you to take away a few strategies that you can implement in your own nutrition and your own lifestyle if you experience migraines and you struggle with that or they affect your quality of life overall. But if you think that low carbohydrate diet, living without fiber is obviously not for you, it's not sustainable, it's not something that you would do, definitely you don't have to remove any food group of your diet if that is actually going to affect your adherence or even wanting to try getting things in a better place. But if you think there is room for trying and implementing these strategies and see how your body responds, how your body feels, your migraines go away completely, maybe it's the right approach and the right protocol for you. I have no doubt that Dr. Angela's protocol has worked for so, so many people suffering from chronic migraines that it could be the right approach for you. How much you have to stick to that protocol, it will depend on how much you're willing to give that a try and how are you going to be feeling with those changes in your diet. Where is your baseline and how much you need to change from where you're at right now. Everything is worth giving a try, especially if it's going to improve and reduce your migraines and get you in a much better place. Stay tuned for a third part commentary video where I'm going to be sitting down sharing my thoughts and my own perspective on what this second part of the video was about that I will be sharing with you very soon.